Welcome along. Let's think uh, for today's episode about life events and psychology. So, of course, the desire to um, progress our career and to get on and to do the next thing, you know, the next assistant psychologist post or the next research post or the next rung on the ladder of whatever you are doing can feel really pressuring but of course as well you know with the with the needs of the service um, and the needs of the clients of course because it's not an easy time to be a human right now and so as a result of that you know the need for mental health services has gone through the roof now of course we don't just necessarily work in mental health services you might be working in forensic services um, or you know risk management services or um, you know uh, neuropsychological services which is kind of mental health anyway isn't it but you know what I mean so um, you know it's not easy and you know so the clients might not be coping they might not be coping on a waiting list and they might be phoning up regularly and you have to be on duty dealing with that you know And it's really tricky to really want to be able to run a service and to offer a service to people. But when there are limitations um, in place, um, it can be really tricky um, because we have ways that we can't, you know, respond as we would want to. This can lead to an impact on you as a professional. It can lead to you feeling pretty, you know, pretty stuck and pretty burned out. And that might be the first of the life events which feels relevant to you, um, you know, as an aspiring psychologist. What we don't want is for you to burn out um, on your journey there. But with these conflicting or massively high demands of the service that you work in, it could happen, you know. And so we've got to be able to look after our mental health. We've got to be able to raise a hand, you know, if you feel like you're not managing so well. And actually, it can be really useful if it leads to a period of um, therapy for yourself or something therapeutic, because it can give you really useful insider insight into what it's like to be a client so it's not all bad Um, and of course if it helps you feel better and helps you use different ways to um, to cope with situations so that they crop up less often or less likely to crop up in future then that is a win-win you know what is not to like there Um, We all are thinking about trying to maximise, you know, our window of tolerance to give ourselves more jam in the sandwich to be able to cope better with life as it ebbs and flows and ebb and flow it will. Um, So my life um, ebbed um, when, when my dad was unwell. Um, And grief is another area which can crop up um, right in the middle of your ordinary life when you were least expecting it. And it can be incredibly derailing, um, as I experienced. And if you'd like to read more about that, you can check out the Grief Collective book, Stories of Life, Loss and Learning to Heal. Um, But yeah, grief will be a sucker punch to the gut every time. Um, And, you know, when you're trying to get on in psychology, they can feel like, uh, you know, it's not okay to take your foot off the gas, you know, Um, to react or to take time off from what you're doing. But 
what we know is that you are going to be your best optimal self at work when you feel like you've got more jam in that sandwich um when you feel like you've got more flexibility when you feel like you you know you're not really really hurting in the moment when you're not really reeling from your own personal circumstances and what i found was that whilst my colleagues were incredibly supportive when i did return to work after my dad sadly passed away um that we could try and you know give me cases that weren't about you know cancer that weren't about dead dads you know in a trauma service um there's a surprising amount of kind of you know dead dads unfortunately um some you know have arisen through really traumatic murders you know so it's you know we tried to be as selective as possible about that to look after me um but my dad was called norman um god rest him and you know with the best will in the world i couldn't have predicted that um you know a case of a, 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 a someone i was working with that someone significant in the story was called Norman, you know? And so daily when I was seeing the client, I was having to hear the word Norman. Um, and just, you know, in terms of my own transference issues, um, having to just deal with that and manage that. And so it is worth thinking whether you, whether you are well-placed to be at work at the moment, if you are suffering with grief um, and whether you can, raise that with your supervisor um, or you know maybe rejig what you're doing so that you're less likely to be triggered whilst you're hurting um, but it might be useful so I found it really helpful to have some EMDR so eye movement desensitization and reprocessing to help me with my grief and that absolutely helped me to you know feel more contained about it to stop things being so leaky um, but, you know, when the when these sucker punches happen and something really significant happens in our life, um, you know, you're allowed to be human. None of us are superhuman or should be thinking that we ought to be. So if you've got that in your in your head as the ideal, then it might just be worth having a little rethink about that. Another big life event can be um, becoming a parent. And I will be back to talk with you about this um, just after that ad break. If you're looking to become a psychologist, then let this be your guide. Filled with lessons and experience that will help you get Hello, my name is Veronica Kasova. I live in Edinburgh and I just graduated with a Master's in Psychology of Mental Health. Marion recommended me the Clinical Psychologist Collective when I was networking on LinkedIn and I must say I love it. Um, it is one of a kind. It's like a window into the lives of people on the path of becoming a psychologist. The stories are unique, honest and filled with a kind of intangible wisdom only personal storytelling can uncover. A common thread in the stories I valued most was to be compassionate not only with others, but with myself too. Also, not fixating on becoming a psychologist, but enjoying life, growth, and the final results will come as a byproduct. Marianne, thank you for taking the time to collate all the stories. The book is a true gem, and I think every aspiring psychologist should have a copy on their shelf. Thank you. If you're looking to become 
a psychologist Then let this be your guide Filled with lessons and experience That will help you get qualified So come and take a look It's right here in this book It's the Clinical Psychologist Collective It's the Clinical Psychologist So becoming a parent, this is something that I get asked reasonably often, you know, should I have a baby, you know, before I start my training? Should I have a baby during training? Is it best to wait until after training? And I think it's such a unique decision based on you, you know, based on your age, based on your gender, based on your ideals for, you know, what kind of parent you'd like to be. Um, so I know um, that for me, it felt like being an attachment parent um, and, uh, you know, using principles of gentle parenting felt like they resonated with me most. OK, so that's, you know, baby wearing and uh, breastfeeding as a breastfeeding mama. Um, even with children with tongue ties so to overcome that um, and you know bed sharing when needed um, as well and actually that would have been tricky if I was trying to work um, as you know aspiring psychologist at that time but you know like many things in life we do just get on you know, and make the best of a situation. And actually, if you feel like the time is right for you to start a family or to expand your family, then, you know, then that might well be what you want to do. Um, and I think that I am most definitely a better psychologist since becoming a parent, um, because it's given me new insight into you know, positive regard and unconditional uh, positive regard, um, giving me new insight into love and, you know, difficult feelings and parenting, um, you know, with a partner um, and staying on the same team, even when you don't always agree. It's, you know, I've really learned a lot. Um, and so it's not, I'm not suggesting that you have a child to become a better psychologist. Please don't think that's what I'm saying. But, you know, like learning to dance in the rain, isn't it? That you might well, you know, stumble across new insights and reflections that are really useful, you know, so um, that you do make interesting talking points for interviews, you know, when you're demonstrating points, when you're demonstrating that, that you have a good real life application of theory and can weave that into your understanding about clients um, and to, to advance your skills in being an aspiring psychologist. And another common life event can be relationship breakdown. Um, you know, when you thought someone was gonna be your forever, um, and you hope they might be, or even if they were your just for now, you know, I absolutely during training spent a few days laying on a sofa wailing because the person I thought was going to be my right now for a bit longer wasn't. <laughs> oh, dear. Poor, poor Marianne. She was hurting. She was hurting. And so if you're experiencing your own heartache, um, you know, heart goes out to you because it's not easy you know when you're trying to navigate that um, and while still showing up and still being present you know um, still trying to help clients and your staff team when actually your your world has got a bit dented um, so yeah you know it's important to think about who you're able to talk to about things like this, you know, are you well supported by your family? Have you got friends that you can talk to about it? Um, even if they can't change it, which of course we often know, 
they can't, you know, but can they hear you? You know, and I think with relationships, um, it can be really useful to think about, you know, you've already imagined, you know, the next stages. You might already have imagined, um, you know, children or you know you might even have booked holidays or weddings or something like that and so to then alter your um your perception of what your life might look like in future can be tricky it can be problematic and you can allow yourself to grieve you know for what what you've lost and you absolutely can grieve for things that haven't yet happened, you know, for things that you had imagined would happen. You know, it's it's taken your life in a, a deviation from the course that that you would have hoped for. And we kind of have to hope that things might work out for the best. And that's, you know, what what's for you doesn't pass you by, but it doesn't always feel that way. And that's sometimes a way that we make sense of what's happening to us, but doesn't necessarily help us to deal with that pain, you know, um, doesn't get that person to change their mind or be the, per- you know, you might be the person that's decided to end this relationship because they're not the person that you need. And yet you can still grieve for that relationship. And I know that another common um, issue for aspiring psychologists is another um, biggie, and it's where you live. So it's really common to be applying for jobs all over the country and maybe even the world, you know, when you're an aspiring psychologist to try and build those skills and competencies that you might be lacking. You know, you recognised you would um, benefit from, you know, new new skills, experiences and opportunities. So I know at any one time um, in sort of 2006, 2007, I think I had an interview being offered to me in Nottingham, one in the Lake District, you know, bearing in mind I was living near Milton Keynes, um, and one in Birmingham. You know, that's quite a big spread. Um, that's, That's massive, isn't it? And, you know, I think if I'd been offered those jobs, um, two of the interviews I didn't actually end up going to in the end, but um, if I'd been offered those, I would have considered relocating, even though I didn't know anyone there. And I know that's really common in psychology to just up sticks and go somewhere else, especially when you start training. Um, but that takes time to to adjust to, you know, to find somewhere to live and to make sure you've got to feel safe there if you don't know the area of the country that you're going to be living in and to find new um, new normal, you know, takes time. Um, as well as trying to throw yourself into this new job, you're, you know, doing something pretty important, which is, you know, settling into a new home environment. Um, and that might be that you're renting with others and trying to you know, get through all of that, everything that's inherent in that as well. So there are absolutely um, many, many different life events that can crop up on your journey to being an aspiring psychologist. So I thought it would be useful to just give you a little bit of an overview of those. And if you've got any more life events that you'd like me to talk about, just give me a shout. Um, I do have um, a five day challenge coming up. So if you'd like some opportunities for free to learn about, um, you know, building the skills and competencies to help you be uh, the psychologist you would like to be, then do check out www.goodthinkingpsychology forward slash aspire www.goodthinkingpsychology.co.uk forward slash aspire. I will look forward to catching up with you for our next episode um, very soon. Take care. If you're looking to become a psychologist,